The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus sextal. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We're looking at love believeth all things. So let's get into our definitions of what we're actually talking about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7 we read, Regarding love, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And we're focusing in on the idea of believeth all things. What does it mean that love believes all things? Well, what we're talking about is to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. It makes sense, right? If I believe something, I believe that it's true and that it's worthy of my trust. It's kind of two components there, believing that something is true and also the idea that it's worthy of my trust. When we love and practice biblical love, we believe in God and what God has said. And when it comes to biblical love, it believes in the love of God. In 1 John 4.16 we read, We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. What have we believed? The love God has to us. When we preach the gospel, the word gospel means good news. It's good news about the love of God that he has shown to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. We believe that God loved us, and we believe if we dwell in the love of God then God dwells in us. How should that love be shown? Well, by keeping his commandments. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That love is returned to God through obedience to him. And that love is also shown to our fellow man. In 1 John 4, 10 and 11, here is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If God loved us, and he did, then we ought to show that love to one another. Christians believe. Christians believe in the love of God and believe in showing that love back to God and believe in showing the love of God to fellow man. And we believe in Jesus. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. We believe in Jesus and the ability to gain eternal life. That Jesus is the way to eternal life. In 2 Timothy 1 verses 10 through 12, now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Christian believes in God, in Jesus, and in his word. He believes that God will grant him eternal life if he obeys God, and he believes in the practice of biblical love and all of its attributes. And that love should be shown back to God and to fellow man. Do we put our trust in Jesus? Remember the definition that we're dealing with is love believes, and believe is to think that something is true and worthy of our trust. Is Jesus worthy of our trust? Because notice what Paul writes here. I know whom I have believed. Doesn't that sum up Christianity pretty well? Love believes all things. What does Christian love believe in? It believes in Jesus. 
I know in whom I have believed. Not only but that, that Paul believes Jesus is true, but he has found Jesus worthy to put his trust in him. He is persuaded that Jesus is able to keep that which Paul has committed unto him against that day. Paul has placed his entire life, his entire soul, and his entire salvation in Jesus. He has believed Jesus and he's found Jesus worthy of trust. So much so that when it comes to the day of judgment, he says, I've committed it all to Jesus for that day. Because I am persuaded he is able. Has Jesus shown that he is worthy of our trust? Has Jesus shown that he's worthy of putting my soul in his hands? Has he shown that he is worthy of trusting when it comes to resurrection and life? Absolutely. Absolutely. He lived a holy and perfect life. He overcame death. He resurrected and ascended back to heaven. Who else would we follow in trying to find our way back to heaven? As I like to point out, who would you ask directions from? Somebody who's been there or somebody who's never been there? Some, so many people in religion trust in man who has never been to heaven on how to get there. Jesus lived in heaven, came to earth, and went back to heaven. He knows how to get to heaven. He knows the directions. Where is the Christian belief? In whom have you found worthy of trust? Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I believe there's also another component besides belief in God, and that's belief in man. I believe that practicing biblical love also means believing in your fellow man. Specifically, I am talking about not believing something evil about your fellow man until you've talked to that person to get their side of the story. In simple terms, you've heard this phrase, giving someone the benefit of the doubt. I believe that's what part of practicing biblical love is, is believing in your fellow man unless you have strong evidence to the contrary. If I hear something negative about someone second, third, or even fourth hand, I should not believe it unless I talk to the person first to get their side of the story and confirm whether or not it's true. I should not act as if it's true, and I should not pass the idea on to others. Too many people in this world, including in the brotherhood, are ready to believe something negative about somebody else and won't bother to pick up the phone and call the person in question and ask to hear their side of the story. I'm reminded of the story of my friend Philip who was in the Philippines who were having a discussion of whether or not to disfellowship Dave Miller. And Philip just simply may have asked him, have you talked to Dave Miller? No, we haven't talked to him. So you're sitting around having a discussion about whether to disfellowship somebody from the church and you haven't even heard their side of the story. That's not right. How would you feel if they did that to you? How would you feel if you walked in the church building one morning and everybody said, you're not welcome here because the congregation heard something evil about you and we believed it and we decided to disfellowship you. And they'd never even bothered to pick up the phone and call you to see what your side of the story was. How would you feel? Would that be right? Not at all. Well, what about in my regular life? If I hear something negative about someone else, do I automatically believe it? Do I start acting as if it's true? Or do I practice biblical love that believes in man? Think about some of these questions. What would happen to our church if we started believing evil things about each other, even if we had no proof? What would happen to our evangelism if we just started saying, well, people out in the world are evil, they're not interested in the gospel, no one wants to listen? What would happen to you if people believed and acted upon all the negative things that have been said about you? 
There's been a bunch of negative things said about me. I've heard it. They didn't say it to my face, but that doesn't mean I didn't hear it. What would have happened to you if people believed you were evil and couldn't change and never bothered to teach you the truth of the gospel in the first place? What if someone didn't have belief in you and said, I'm not even going to bother teaching you the gospel. You won't believe it. You're too evil. Where would you be today? Probably not right here. What would have happened to you if you were, people wrote you off as a sinner when you repented and, and said, well, they're just evil. We, we, don't, we want to, don't want to deal with them anymore. Where would this world be if we stopped believing in the possibility of good in others? Galatians 6, 1 says, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Why would we practice restoration if we didn't believe in the possibility that someone could be good? In James chapter 5 and verse 16, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Why would we pray for one another if we believe that sinners who made mistakes should be kicked to the curb? I hear something negative about you, then I just write you off. You're done. I've experienced that. When I was younger, I was told by a friend of mine that Christians are the only ones who kill their wounded. I don't think that's true in, in every case, but unfortunately I've experienced that type of attitude. I made a bad judgment call once while working for Truth for the World, and someone from a different congregation talked to me about it and started bemoaning the fact that the congregation used to be faithful and started talking as if the whole place had strayed down the path to hell and went unfaithful. In reality, the congregation probably didn't even know about it. It was the decision of myself and perhaps one other person. We'd not all strayed down the path to hell. In fact, the issue was a judgment call rather than a sin. But to me, this person talked on the phone as if all the congregation had just went off the deep end. One bad decision, and he seemed ready to just write the congregation off as if they'd all strayed down the path to hell. Not really a lot of belief, in my opinion. Not really a lot of love. In contrast, I made a separate decision that was probably not the smartest, and I was contacted by a man named David Lemons. I'll mention his name because he actually did the right thing. He contacted us privately. He did it with tact, and he talked as if he was unsure we were aware that what we did might be considered a bad idea. And he made a suggestion. Once we understood what he said, we agreed, we corrected the issue, we thanked him for his help, and that was the end of it. To me, it was almost night and day difference between how people treated me when I did something wrong. Did they have any belief in me that I had any good in me, or did they just see I'd done something wrong and write me off as if I was lost? Which one is practicing biblical love? In my opinion, David Lemons did it right. He practiced biblical love that believed in his fellow Christians instead of writing them off as lost. He didn't condemn us, but he gave us the benefit of the doubt. He practiced biblical love by being patient with us, giving us the benefit of the doubt, helping us, and giving us a chance to make it right, and not crying over the fact that we've all become unfaithful and gone off the deep end. What do you believe about your fellow man? Everybody makes mistakes. Do you write them off? You say, well, they're done. I'll never work with them again. They're evil and they can never have an opportunity to change. Or do you suck it up and be patient and say, well, let's just work with them and try and teach. And maybe they'll learn. What if somebody had just written us off when we made a mistake? Or thought that we were so evil that we weren't worth teaching the gospel? Once again, the golden rule. Would we like others to believe something negative about us without giving us a chance to explain? Would we like it if we overheard rumors and gossip about ourselves, but no one ever came to us to ask our side of the story? 
Believing in the negative gossip about others and not even asking them to relay their side of the story is not practicing biblical love. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. If you don't want people doing that to you, you better not be doing it to them. I don't care how many times I hear it. I don't care if it's second, third, fourth hand information. If it's something negative about somebody, I better not believe it and I better not act on it until I call them and talk to them personally, one-on-one, and get their side of the story. And that doesn't just go for individuals, that goes for congregations. If I hear there's a congregation in Wisconsin doing something bad, that's second-hand information. How do I know that's true? Before I believe it and act on it, I'd better call the congregation and talk to them personally. Isn't that what you'd want them to do if it was something negative about you? Give you a chance to explain? Biblical love believes in the love of God, in Jesus, and the salvation he offers to mankind. Paul said it so well, I know in whom I have believed. Paul had his belief in Jesus. And he knew that Jesus was capable of delivering the salvation that he offers. The Christian shows biblical love back to God by obeying his commandments and showing biblical love to our fellow man. I obey God by showing love to God rather by obeying his commandments. One way I show love to my fellow man is I give him the benefit of the doubt. I believe in fellow man until I have strong evidence to the contrary. The Christian shows biblical love by treating his man in a fellow man rather in a way that he would want to be treated such as not believing negative things heard about someone without first getting their side of the story. You know, even our judicial system would give you the opportunity usually to speak up and tell your side of the story if you choose to do so. Why don't we give that same courtesy to other people? Why do we believe negative things about them without calling them or asking them to their face, I heard this about you, is it true? What's your side of the story? The Christian shows biblical love to his fellow man by not acting on negative things heard about someone. See, it's not just not believing, but choosing not to act on that. If I hear something negative about somebody, I first have to choose not to believe it until I confirm it and hear their side of the story. But I also have to choose not to act on it. When I interact with that person again, I have to act as if I never heard it. I have to act as if I never heard it because I don't know if it's true. And I have to treat them in a way as if I never heard it until they have a chance to tell their side of the story. Also, the Christian shows biblical love to his fellow man by not listening to gossip and backbiting in the first place to prevent its spread. If you've got something negative to say about somebody in the congregation, I don't really want to hear it. If you've got something negative about what another congregation is doing, I don't really want to hear it. Unless I need to hear it. I mean, if somebody's burning the church building down, maybe somebody needs to be told about that. If somebody is in sin, then, you know, follow Matthew 18. You go. If you know somebody's sinning, then you go personally and talk to them. And then if they won't repent, then you go tell somebody else. That's Matthew 18. But if somebody does something wrong, it's not your opportunity to just get on a platform and start shouting it to everybody about somebody's doing something wrong. I don't want to hear it unless I need to hear it. I'm reminded when somebody said something to me once, I've told you this before probably, they said, can I tell you something? And I asked them, should you? And they stopped for a minute and thought about it. And then they said, no, I guess I shouldn't. And I said, well, then don't. To this day, I have no idea what they were going to tell me. 
And I don't want to know because apparently they shouldn't tell me. But they just stop for a second to think about it and think, you know what, maybe I shouldn't tell this. If I give you an audience, if I give you an ear for gossip and backbiting, then I'm supporting you and I'm enabling you. As a fellow Christian, if you come to me with gossip and backbiting about somebody else, it really is my duty to say, you're sinning, you need to stop. Not listen to it, but rather say, backbiting and gossip is a sin, you need to stop. I don't want to hear it. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. Or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. One of the big illusions being taught today is the idea of tolerance. We are told to be tolerant of others' lifestyles and to be tolerant with those with whom you do not agree. Well, the Bible says as much as you can to live peaceably with all men, but the idea of tolerance being advocated and taught today is actually hypocrisy. Take homosexuality, for example. If I speak out and say that practicing homosexuality is wrong, I might be labeled intolerant and told that I need to tolerate alternative lifestyles. Well, why cannot I practice my lifestyle that believes homosexuality is wrong? Why are others who teach tolerance so intolerant to my lifestyle and beliefs? The truth is that when people teach tolerance, they often teach tolerate what I believe and be intolerant to those who believe differently. And that's not being tolerant. This has been a brief message from truthfortheworld.org. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter told the crowd to repent and be baptized. Did you notice the simple conjunction and? You remember conjunctions from English class, right? It's that simple little word that joins two or more things together. You probably use it all the time. When you order food, you might say, give me steak and potatoes. When you ask for dry cleaning, you might say, clean the pants and the jacket. We know what the word and means. We use it all the time. But so many will argue strongly that baptism is not necessary for salvation or that the Bible does not say baptism is necessary. I wonder what those people would say if the waiter just brought them the potatoes or the dry cleaner just cleaned the pants. Would they argue about the use of the word and? If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. If I could show you one place in the Bible that shows that baptism saves, would you then accept that as a fact? In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 we read, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism does save. Baptism alone does not save, because we also read in Mark 16:16, 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And we also need to repent. Jesus said in Luke 13:3, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We also read confession is important. Jesus said in Matthew 10:32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So does baptism, belief, repentance, or confession save? Well, in fact, they all do when they are combined together in sincere obedience to God. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Save the planet. Save the planet. We hear this pretty often. Does the planet really need saving? God has told us in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So basically, as long as the earth is here, we will have seasons and day and night. But aren't people trying to save the planet so that it will continue to be around? Perhaps. But God is going to destroy the planet, not man. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 says that the heavens and the earth are reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. The earth is guarded by God until the day of judgment when it will be consumed by fire. We need to put a higher priority on saving our souls and the souls of others over saving a planet that will be destroyed by God. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at 
P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. In our busy lives, we probably don't take much time to just sit and think. Your job may even give you projects to work on, but not much time to think about how to do them. By the time you get home from work, there may still be so much to do that thinking is not even on your agenda. Perhaps thinking is not even something we consider a regular activity or something to try and work into our lives. We may see it as a waste of time. But some ideas are too weighty and important not to think about them. Some questions demand time to think about them. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? The answers to these questions will literally determine your answers to all the other questions of life. Now that's something worth thinking about. This has been a message from truthfortheworld.org. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit the United States. An atheist organization stated we should not be praying for the people affected by the hurricane. Instead, we should be sending them aid. Really? An atheist organization is telling us what we should and should not do? That sounds to me like they're telling me what is right and wrong. That sounds to me like they're making a moral judgment. Well, that begs the question, by what standard are they making this moral judgment of what is right and wrong? Well, I doubt it's by the Bible, so who is making this determination, and why should I follow them? What makes their judgment of morals any better than mine? Atheism is hypocritical because it claims no God and no right or wrong because the universe is an accident, but then atheists try to tell us what we should and should not do. This has been a brief message from truthfortheworld.org. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. What's the best way to get somewhere people don't normally go? Would you ask someone who had never been there before, or would you ask someone who has come from there? Well, how do you get to heaven? Would you ask someone who has never been there before, like all men living today? Or would you ask someone who came from there, like Jesus Christ? Jesus said in John 14:6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus said he was the way to the Father and that we need to go through him in order to get to the Father in heaven. Well, that makes a lot of sense. If Jesus knew the Father and came from heaven, he could certainly point the way back to him better than so many men who have come up with their own ideas on how to get to heaven, even though they've never been there. This has been a brief message from truthfortheworld.org. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. Learn the easy way with Truth For The World Bible College. Dozens of high-quality Bible education courses are available at truthfortheworld.education. Study on your own time and at your own pace. Certificates are awarded after every course. Plus, there's no enrollment fees, tuition, or charge for provided class materials. Why wait? Start your online study now and check back frequently for new courses.